Gentlemen, welcome back to the Tiege Hanley starting a business, building a brand vlog. This one, big number 114. So we got some more exciting news. <laughs> first things first, before we jump into the questions from last vlog from you guys, I want to talk about some exciting news, which is the reduction in shipping costs from for four certain countries. We've got Canada now, five dollars shipping. What? Exactly. Germany, $6, Australia, $6, Sweden, $7, Norway, $9, and the UK, like we talked about, $6. This is pretty exciting stuff, right? Um, but it's a risk on our part because honestly, T. Chanley is subsidizing these countries a little bit, meaning um, US, free shipping, right? We eat the shipping cost, that kind of, that, that chops into our bottom line and our margins. But it's like, hey, you know, in order to be competitive, you need to have free shipping. But in these other countries, it's, it's a lot more expensive to ship, and we just can't do that. Previously, we were pretty much charging $12 across the board, but we have been diligent and, and working super hard in order to lower and reduce our shipping costs, thinking that if we can get our shipping costs down internationally, we can increase the amount of A, customers that we get, and B, retention. Because a lot of people are trying it, and it's like, oh, this is good, we like it, we would keep doing it if our shipping cost was actually lower, but it's, it's kind of tough. If the product is costing you $25 for, for a level one system and shipping is $12, you know, it, it's kind of hard to swallow, even though the reality is that selling a kit, a level one kit for even, you know, say we included the cost plus shipping for $37, $12 shipping plus 25 is 37 Okay, $37 is still in a phenomenal deal for the products that you're getting. But for customers to see that you're paying $12, it's, it's kind of hard to swallow. But our thinking is that even though we're eating some money on the shipping costs and we're, we're losing money now <laughs> with shipping, it's going to be made up by the volume. We're going to increase that and also the retention. More people are going to stick to the Teach Hanley system. You know, we're not trying to make money on shipping. We're just not trying to lose a lot of money. Um, this also brings up another point. There are, in the near future, going to be some countries that we actually stop sending to. And the reason for this is that the cost of doing business in that country is more expensive, or I should say the expense outweighs the, the potential benefit. And we, we talked and touched a little bit last week about, you know, it costs us a lot of money when we ship a product out and it doesn't arrive at its destination. These countries all are really solid. We know for a pretty high degree of certainty that if we ship something to Australia, it's going to arrive. Sweden, it's going to arrive. Germany, it's going to arrive, so on and so forth. But there are a lot of countries where the postal service doesn't work quite as well. And DH, it's just, it's expensive because when we get a return, we're not only eating the cost of the product like we talked about last week, we eat the cost of shipping and then for us to ship it out again, like at the end of the day, it's just not worth it. And there are certain countries that the likelihood of it not arriving where it's supposed to is super high. And so for that, we got to say it's time to go. But the good news, a lot of you guys, and these are the majority of our international customers. Those are the ones that we want to make sure that we get as low as possible. We want to make sure everybody as low as possible and we're going to continue to try and get other countries that aren't on this list or the UK down. Um, it's, it's just, it's something we got to work at. But honestly, $12 shipping is cheaper than I charge for Pete and Pedro, like a lot cheaper. Just because it is. <laughs> and, and Pete and Pedro, it's also heavier. So that's the other thing. Like, like Pete and Pedro packages the ship are going to be like over a pound a lot of them and that like automatically like skyrockets shipping cost. But uh, but Tiege Hanley is a little bit lighter and so it's, it's easier to get that number down. We're gonna continue to work. We're continuing to try and get every country down. But right now, these are the, these are the ones that we were able to figure out and we're really excited about it. And hopefully we, we, we made a calculated correct decision. We're going to revisit this in the spring to see sort of what the numbers look like. Thanks to um, our controller, they're going to help, or she is going to help sort of identify what's happened. Has traffic, has sales, has every, I just spit like crazy, sorry. Is everything up? 
And is it, was it a good business decision or are we sort of losing too much money? That's going to be something that we're going to determine. And it's incredible to have Kathleen on board to help us with that. But now I would like to talk a little bit real quick before we get to the questions about next week. Going to be in Chicago taking a field trip. Going to take you guys with us. We're going to sit down with everybody, Josh, Tom, Tommy, Kathleen, Kelly, Rob, and myself headed to headquarters. And is it wrong that I'm so excited to play ping pong? We have a ping pong table now. We also, I think, have the new location or the new spot upstairs that will able, uh, be able to get in and, and bring you guys and show you the new addition to our, our space. Um, we just basically, the way that the building works, it, it's multiple levels. I think three or four levels. And we right now are on level two where we have two units. One is sort of like Kelly's office and the other one is where we store Tiege Hanley. But now we've got a bigger space upstairs and it's going to be where all the offices are, some conference rooms, and it's not going to be like finished. We're still working on that, but I think we're going to be able to get in there next week. And so I'm excited to go check it out and to show you guys. But I'm most excited to play ping pong. <laughs> I am going to kick everybody's ass. I'm, I'm laying it out there. <laughs> I love ping pong. And I'm super competitive, apparently. But next week, going to sit down with everybody. So if you guys have questions in this vlog, please down below let us know. We'll have everybody together. It's going to be a great vlog. And I'm so excited about traveling to Chi-Town to hang out at headquarters. But now, let's get to your questions. Great question by Zenek. Kowalski. Sorry for butchering that, brother. We love you. How do you choose which business venture to go with? I'm having a problem with doing too many projects at once, um, all which I'm passionate about, but they're only 24 hours in a day. This is absolutely correct, my friend. It's tough, but at the end of the day, you've got to decide which one makes you A, happiest, and B, which one should be a business or has the biggest potential for turning into something that is, is, is scalable. Because there are a lot of things that, that I'm passionate about. There's a lot of things that most people are passionate about. But only certain things are going to be able to be turned or transitioned into a business. And you've got to sort of identify which things are hobbies and which things are, are viable business opportunities. You've got to decide. Even though, like you say, like I love so many things, there are only a few or probably one, if you're honest with yourself, that has the most potential. And you've really got to determine which one that is for yourself. But until you know, it's amazing. Try a bunch of different things and see which hobbies can actually turn into a business that, that actually will make money. And the other beautiful thing is that you try a bunch of different things. If you think something's great and you try it and nobody else buys it or it's, it's really difficult and, and it's just not gaining any traction, then it's probably time to sort of put that on the back burner or relegate that to the hobby bin as opposed to the business bin and then try something else. It's, it's what I've done. It's what, what a lot of entrepreneurs do, do. But right now, try a bunch of things, identify which one has the most potential to make a bunch of money for you. James Humphreys has a business question. Do you pay employees per hour or per task they do? I love Tee Hanley more than my double monk straps. <laughs> that is incredible and great question. It depends on the employee, really. It depends on what they're doing. The, um, you know, all the people that, that work for Tee Hanley on a full-time basis, like Tom, Tommy, Josh, Kathleen, like they all are salary employees. They're not hourly. But our team that comes in at night, they actually get paid a, a like a per box assembled thing. And it's great for them because they can, you know, crank out as, as many as, as they can and, and it's a lot better. And so really it, it's better for everybody because they are incentivized to sort of, you know, crank out as many as they can. And if they don't want to work as hard, they don't get paid as much. And for us, it's, it's a production thing. We don't care how many you do in an hour. We don't care if it takes you an hour to pack 100 boxes or three hours. As long as those boxes get done, we're happy. And so for them, it's per piece or per unit packaged. For everybody else, it's hourly. Jocino, <laughs> I guess that's your name, I'm sorry. Uh, with your company not performing at its peak in terms of SEO, what are you doing to combat that? Sorry, I just love all things SEO, so it's interesting to see how a company handles that. You know, SEO or search engine optimization is, is a tough thing. Um, what's up, Cam? <laughs> UPS. <laughs> just, got, 
just got a package. Um, I, and, and I wouldn't tell you or show you this, but um, I wanted to. I got shirts, okay? These are shirts that I bought that I am thinking about actually putting my, my logo for, for the little sleeve thing for Emma Apparel. And the reason I bring this up is that the way that you do that, because I know that a lot of people are into, well, some people, if you're into thinking about starting apparel, you can either go and have the, the clothing manufactured overseas or wherever you're gonna have it manufactured, or you can go to a, a company like the one that I use, it's called Alpha Broder. And what they do, they are basically a wholesaler of, 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 of other brands that are, that are blank. They, you know, it's like these are alternative apparel, all right, alternative apparel, you see them in stores, it's a very popular brand, but they also sell them so that I, the, the business owner, can actually put my logo or I can put my little, you know, my little thing on the sleeve or a Tej Hanley, uncomplicated, whatever, and then I could sell this. So for apparel, that's how a lot of people start. They'll go and they'll find like the blanks, but there are other ones that you can actually like pop the tag out. And when I first started, I'm like, oh, I need my logo, M Apparel, in the back of the shirt. And so I would just pop the, the tag out, it's called a pop tag, and print my logo and, and label. So it looked like it was my apparel. And some people do that, but I was just like, yo. <laughs> apparel, I thought, was going to be a much bigger thing for me. Over on imalphaM.com, it's, it's, it's not. And I don't, I don't try and sell a ton of merch. And so, busy pitching Pete and Pedro and Tej Hanley. And so merch is cool, but it's not really my game, but it might be yours. Mike Y has a great question and one that, that I can definitely relate with or two. He says, I started a business about five years ago when I was 22. It was a brick and mortar retail store that I was sure would do extremely well. Everybody who starts a business is sure that it's going to do well. For several reasons, it ended up not making it and I had to shut it down last year and move on. I'd sunk just about every dime that I had into the store. Now I'm 27, feel like I'm completely starting over in my professional career. No money left to start anything else, so I had to take a nine to five job with an amazing company, but it still isn't, read more, what I want to be doing as an entrepreneur. I'll be extremely, it will be extremely difficult for me to make or to take the plunge and go for it again, knowing how broke it could leave me if it doesn't work out. Any words of wisdom? Mike, brother, I hear you. I was in the exact same situation that you are, right about the same same age too, around 27. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I had my fitness center that I was sure was gonna be amazing. It ended up not doing all that great. I ended up being bankrupt and had to shut the, the, the business down. And what I would say to you is this, is that it's great that you have a job. Like, don't let that dis discourage you from doing something in the future, but don't rush it, right? You're going to, because you're an entrepreneur and you've got that burning inside of you, you are going to be sort of looking and checking out things and scoping other opportunities. And when you find something that's right, you'll know it. And you're not going to let the fear of failure stand in the way of you making something amazing. Because as an entrepreneur, you know, you get bummed out. Yes, it's scary, right? And it sucks. It, at, at me, I, I guess I was 30 and I was completely broke. I was driving a beer cart, you know, on weekends at a, at a country club. And the worst thing for me and the hardest thing was not knowing what I wanted to do, not knowing what success was because for my entire life, I had this vision of success and what it looked like to me. And at that point at which it failed, it was like, well, shit, what do I do now? And so to our friend, I would say, keep working your job, take some time and, and don't put any pressure on yourself. You know, keep your eye out, test different things. And when you, you find something that's right, go after it. And I, I don't even have to tell you that because once you find something that's right, that, that is in your gut and that you know, or that you feel is right, you're not going to let the past failures dictate your future success. So I know you're going to find it. So don't sweat it. Enjoy the comfort of, of having a job nine to five right now, but eventually it's game time. I forgot to talk about SEO. What are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I'm all over the place. There's so many great questions though. I mean, I'm not going to get to all of them. And so we're going to have to pick this up again, but, um, you know, in terms of SEO, yeah, we're not, we're not firing on all cylinders or all systems, but we're working on it. And, and SEO, search engine optimization, it's the long play. It's not something that you're going to hit a home run and, and everything is great right out of the gate. 
We're doing little things each and every day in order to help ourselves sort of grow. But, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. SEO is, is a tough animal, but we're, we're doing the best job we can and we're putting out content. We're, we're going to start like a, a blog on our website. You know, there, there are a lot of little things that we're, we're working on. And so stay tuned. I'll tell you more once, once we have some, <laughs> something to report. But we have some agencies that are actually helping us have a better SEO presence. And so it's a work in progress. <laughs> Tiffany Graff has a great question. It says, Aaron, I have a business question. I'm currently in a rut at work and can't seem to get out of it. What is some advice that um, you would have about getting out of a rut? <laughs> I have been in, in, in ruts and there, there are some weeks that I still, I feel like I'm in, in a rut. And usually for me, and I can, I can just speak for me and myself, is that I, I'm lacking direction or I, I don't have inspiration. I'm not excited about something. And so for me, it's usually about getting honest with myself and sitting down and, and taking a look, taking an, an inventory of, of what I'm doing and what I'm not happy with. What about what I'm currently doing isn't making me all excited. And true story, or I should say true video, this Monday, I actually shot it last week. It's going to be launching this, this Monday. Um, it's about what do you do if you hate your job? And it's, it's, I think, a pretty great video. And so in there, I sort of touch and talk about some, some things that you can possibly do and, and the steps that you, you might want to take if you truly feel you're in a rut or how to figure out if you're just in a rut or if you just hate your job and you need to do something else. And how do you go about finding something that you're, you're happy and passionate about? Um, that video is going to launch on Monday, so make sure to tune in for that. It's, it's a good video, and if I do say so myself. But ruts happen, you know? We, we get in ruts, we all get in ruts from time to time. But for me, it's, it's just about something's going on. Something's going on with me, usually, and not necessarily the job. And, and sometimes it takes shaking things up. And to get out of the rut, sometimes you gotta make hard decisions. And, and ultimately, you've gotta be the one who decides. But usually for me, when that happens, I'm just, I'm bored or I'm, I'm not inspired or just, it's just not feel, I'm not feeling it. And so I usually have to do something to, to feel it again. And sometimes it may mean taking a little bit of a break and just a breather, getting some perspective, taking some time for me. But, but ultimately you've got to, you've got to figure that out. I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer, but the video Monday pretty solid. And we're going to finish this up with Ned. Ned has three questions in one, but they're all very, very well thought out. And I'm going to just briefly touch on each of them. Uh, Ned says, just wanted to say, I don't personally really care about what you're selling necessarily, but I find it really interesting to get a seemingly honest view into how business works. Aren't you skeptical? Everybody said they have skeptical. It, I mean, <laughs> if you want more honest than this, good luck, because uh, we tell you, you've been there for Watch, what, start from day one, tell me it's not honest. Anyway, three questions. Number one, obviously, competition is a big factor in the skincare market. So at what point of size of T. Shanley do you start to try and be more covert about your actions at T. Shanley? I don't think we ever, I don't know. I mean, here's the thing. We're not, we're not trying to, we're, we're not trying to hide. Like the fact is, is that, that we are having a conversation and a dialogue. And that's one of the reasons, if not the main reason why we've been successful. So for us to stop doing that and not be open with you guys would, is kind of counterproductive and against our culture. And so I don't think we'll ever stop doing that. Now, certain things that we don't talk about, we don't talk about money in terms of how much we make. We don't talk about subscribers in terms of how many subscribers we have or active subs or this and that. That's all like kind of private information. But, you know, I don't, I don't think we ever, we ever will. Um, now, I can't say never because you never know. <laughs> uh, it, it, I've learned that it's, it's, it's not a good idea to say never because whenever you say that, then something happens. But, but we, we give as much as we can. We're as open about things as we can. And honestly, there's no skincare company on this planet that can touch us in terms of authenticity, in terms of engagement, in terms of 
just our, our interaction with our customers. I mean, we started from a social media platform. And so everything we've done from day one has been about you, is about being informing or, or engaging and, and just helping you and, and just wanting to not only help you with your skincare, but just your business and, and you know, sort of dropping the BS that's out there and telling you like it is. And so that's never gonna change, ever. I think. And second question says, you talk about bad business in the video. Uh, some would argue that all business is good business. When does uh, being clever and smart about making money become bad business and how do you feel about all business is good business? Huh? <laughs> no, I got, I got to get him. It's a little, okay. I think that at the end of the day, you've got to feel good about your, your, your sales tactics and there are a lot of businesses out there that are really like shady and sneaky the way that they go about, you know, selling products and, and some of them lie and, and I don't feel that every, all business is good business. I mean, if you can't look yourself in the business, you know, your, your business in the, in the mirror and be like, yo, I'm proud of, of what we do and who we are. I mean, could we do shadier stuff to get business? Probably. But at the end of the day, is it going to add up to us being a long-term successful business? Probably not. There are tons of businesses that out there that do really shady stuff and, and do things that are not exactly up to, up to speed in terms of ethics. And I think ultimately they suffer. Now, might they make a bunch of money? Possibly, but at the end of the day, this is a lot more than just money. It's about loving what you do and, and being proud of the product you're putting out there. And, and the people you're, you're selling it to. And the third part of his question, when hiring people, what do you hate like in interviews? Apart from obvious like rudeness, confidence, except I don't interview people, so I'm not gonna be a, a good person to, to answer this. I think Kelly will be a better one, and he's somebody that we can ask next week. So gentlemen, that is where I'm gonna wrap it up. I wanna thank you for all the incredible questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. Like there are a lot more. And so we'll have to do another one of these really soon. And so guys, just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you. This is how we try to repay you is by lowering your shipping costs when and where possible. And we're going to continue to work on it. And so I'll update you when we have updates. But as of right now, this is the deal. Hopefully you dig it. Thank you. We love you more than our double monk strap shoes. Gentlemen, I'll see you next week in... Chicago.